Okay, so I think what we'll do is I'll hand it over to Jonathan. Um, Jonathan, are you there? I'll get you to share your screen with us. And Gord, maybe, yeah, your spotlight on him. So there's uh, Dr. Fowles, thank you. And I'll pass it over to you, Dr. Fowles, and thank you again for uh, helping us out and doing this great talk for us tonight. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so thank you very much. So I'll be talking about why exercise is medicine tonight. And I first wanted to, uh, now I tested this before. Oh, I put this over there. There we go. There we go. Uh, I first wanted to just kind of highlight, uh, I'm the, the National Chair of Exercises Medicine Canada, uh, and I visited the Refit Center. It's a fabulous facility. And along with uh, the Wellness Institute, you guys have something going pretty good in Winnipeg in that these two medical fitness facilities are uh, really two of the only recognized medical fitness facilities in Canada. There's, I think there's another one even in Winnipeg that you're building, but um, the only certified medical fitness facilities. There are other versions of these types of uh, fitness centers that offer you know, a whole bunch of uh, range of things that basically try and bridge the gap between medicine and community uh, health and fitness. And, but, uh, the one thing that I think really speaks to the, you know, the, the fortunate situation that you're in and, and the gold model, the gold standard that people are trying to attain with what's at refit, for example, is just that a welcoming place for everybody. Uh, one thing I was absolutely blown away with when I was there was the fact that there was people from every walk of life, every body, every shape, every age, uh, you know, in all different areas. And I think that um, one thing that you need to be uh, thankful and appreciative of is the incredible facility and programs and the range of services that you have through the refit. And that's partly due to the vision of your CEO there, Sue Bereski, who uh, has lined up some great speakers for you, starting with, with me this week and, and ongoing, or I think you probably already had uh, uh, some talks already, but the um, like Paul O and, and various others that'll be speaking. And again, that comes down to the vision that uh, Sue has kind of started with exercises, medicine and integrated into your facility. And I'm uh, wanting to kind of give you a little bit of background of where this, this philosophy kind of comes from in based on the, the evidence that uh, has accumulated in this regard. So the whole idea for exercises medicine really started from this person. He's a physician, Bob Salas. He's in the United States with the American College of Sports Medicine. And this is one of his quotes. What if there was one prescription that could prevent and treat dozens of diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, and obesity? Would you prescribe it to your patients? And certainly, and, and this was based on the accumulating and overwhelming evidence that kind of came out of the, the 90s and the early 2000s about the benefit of physical activity and exercise uh, to all these different chronic diseases compared to medications, for example. And so this is kind of like the, the heavy hitter slide right here with the fact that, you know, the evidence that accumulated across all these conditions that physical activity at the right intensity could reduce the incidence of hypertension and diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, colon cancer, breast cancer, Alzheimer's disease. And there's basically evidence across over 35 different chronic conditions now. And if you look at the green numbers on this slide, it's basically a quarter to a third across all these conditions. If you attain that uh, physical activity guideline of 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity uh, to vigorous intensity physical activity. The right number is if you do enough physical activity at a high enough intensity for a certain amount of duration that we consider exercise that would increase your fitness level, 
then the effects of physical activity can even be more dramatic. And that's where exercise is medicine in how it can affect all these different conditions at an even greater level and reducing the risk of premature death by one third to two thirds in certain uh, studies have been shown. So I'm gonna dive into that a little bit more deeply in a little bit with some of the, the evidence, but that kind of is the take home message of tonight's talk is that exercise really is a potent uh, therapy and a potent mode for the prevention and treatment of many, many chronic diseases. One of the, the other reasons why physical activity and exercise is of interest for public health is that it is one of the most economical ways to improve the health and wellness of a population. We know that our population is aging and that multimorbidity and the chronic diseases is the biggest challenge that we face in our primary healthcare system. So I do a lot of work with healthcare and one of the things that they show is that multimorbidity increases faster than does age <laughs> uh, and more rapidly than individual chronic diseases is that over the age of 60, uh, the average person has three chronic conditions and it increases in multiples every decade after that. And what we see in our healthcare system is that 5% of users that have multimorbidities drive about two thirds of the cost and 40% have multiple ongoing conditions across many years that, that they are trying to manage within communities. And so therefore community resources such as medical fitness facilities and things can play a huge role in trying to address that. Exercise is a single uh, mode, single treatment that addresses multiple conditions. So you saw in that previous slide that it, it cuts across all those different conditions. And the evidence against in the trials that have compared it to the effectiveness of medications, for example, show that it's as or more effective for the primary and secondary prevention of stroke, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes, and has those prevention and treatment effects across all more than 30 conditions now. And then it's actually more cost effective in treating multimorbidity because physical activity can affect all these different conditions. If you treat multimorbidity with medications, your costs go up for each medication, for example, that you add to the mix. And, you know, the average 70 year old is now on six, seven medications, whereas exercise can take the effect of you know, a hypertensive medication, a diabetes medication, um, even uh, medications for, you know, treatment of anxiety, depression, Alzheimer's disease, and that one treatment of getting 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity and doing resistance exercise a couple times a week can address all those things. And for each condition, the actual relative cost goes down because you're using that one treatment for all different conditions. So it's actually more cost effective in treating multimorbidity than a typical medical management model. So we know that there's numerous physical and mental health benefits of physical activity and exercise. Many people associate health benefits with improved life expectancy and fitness and improved sleep and weight loss and then the primary and secondary prevention of long-term conditions. But we know that it also has uh, potent effects on mental health, such as um, increased participation and socialization, reduced risk of depression, improved mood, confidence and self-esteem, um, as well as improved body image and attitudes towards physical activity. So again, not only does it have effects on specific conditions, but it also has multiple effects across you know, psychological, sociological, as well as physical outcomes. And this is why we have guidelines that promote uh, physical activity for the Canadian population. And Canada is actually a world leader in physical activity guidelines development. And we've now gone towards this 24 hour movement guidelines approach. And Canada was the first ones in the world to do this. They developed it for preschool, children, and youth. 
And now they've also developed it for uh, adults and older adults. And this was actually just released October 16th. And interestingly enough, the World Health Organization has kind of adopted some of the characteristics of this, but not the full 24 hour movement guideline approach uh, in the guidelines that they just released today. So they released the physical activity guidelines from the World Health Organization. And many of the guidelines are similar here um, to the World Health one, like the World Health uh, was kind of adopting some of these things, but Canada is the world leader in this integrated approach that physical activity, um, is across a range that we wanna get light physical activities and reduce our sedentary behavior. We want to get moderate to vigorous physical activity and that's where we get this, the uh, uh, steps in the little four diagram there. Uh, we wanna get some moderate to vigorous and that's that heart pumping activity. We wanna accumulate seven to nine hours of sleep because there's very good evidence that shows that sleep really interacts with physical activity that if we're not getting enough physical activity, our sleep is compromised. And if our sleep is compromised, we also don't get as much physical activity because we don't feel as, as uh, energetic to, to be active. And one of the key drivers of both of those things is the amount of sedentary behavior. We need to limit our sedentary time to eight hours or less per day. And that's part of the one of the reasons why I'm standing during this presentation. Uh, and that we get no more than three hours of recreational screen time. Now we know that that's a challenge in this COVID environment. There's you know, papers that have been published very recently based on the first wave of the COVID situation where people's physical activity dropped on average by 15 to 30% and their screen time increased by a commensurate amount. And so that's something that we need to be aware of in this second wave that we're doing all these virtual things online, but it's important to make sure that we're, we're being mindful about being active as much as we can. And so um, if anybody wants to stand during this call and you know do a few reps or uh, move their feet around, I, I fully support that initiative because uh, because uh, limiting our sedentary behavior is one of the, the important steps we can take for our health. How, so we have these guidelines and so it's interesting to see how this relates to how we're doing as Canadians. And so if we ask Canadians, are you meeting the guidelines? About half of Canadians report that they are. And this is also corroborated by some of the evidence that we get through accelerometry where if we look at uh, how many Canadians meet about 7,500 steps a day. On average, about 7,500 steps a day equates to approximately 150 minutes a week of accumulated physical activity. And that's where we get that relationship of what Canadians self-report as their meeting guidelines. So those two numbers actually kind of jive uh, relatively well. Many of you have heard about the 10,000 steps a day and, and that was a nice big round number that was uh, basically promoted since you know the early 80s and 90s and there wasn't a lot of evidence behind it at the time it was just a nice big round number and now they figured out that that is considered if you're above 10,000 steps a day that's highly active physically active our previous guidelines actually had 150 minutes of MVPA accumulated in bouts of 10 minutes or more and that was really more of an exercise kind of prescription in the sense that uh, if you accumulated in bouts of 10 minutes or more, that means that you're doing more purposeful activity. And we know that more Canadians struggle with that. Only about 16% of Canadians are accumulating that bouted physical activity, which is really exercise. But the interesting thing is, though, is that the exercise does carry those dose response effects that it does improve fitness. So there is some benefit to getting there. The ones who do regular exercise, 30 minutes uh, a day, you know, five to seven days a week is only about 5% of the population, but their fitness in that population is much higher and their health is, is much greater. One of the things that's important to uh, recognize is that we as Canadians and North Americans and people in advanced or in first world cultures now, are sedentary the great majority of the day. We're sedentary about 10 hours a day. We get light physical activity, maybe about two hours a day. 
and we get MV that moderate to vigorous, the average, the Canadian average is about 24 minutes a day. So there's work to be done there. And that those numbers are basically the exact opposite of how we have been physiologically and historically for hundreds, if not thousands of years. So that's where I'm going to put this into context that now we do a lot of things, you know, involving a computer and seated and, and that kind of thing. But that's not how our our bodies kind of adapted to our environments. And so to take a step back, to put this into context, why, and, and to understand why exercise is medicine and why physical activity has such potent effects on our health, it's because we as humans are physiologically the exact same as our ancestors from 10,000 years ago and 50,000 years ago, essentially. And that, you know, our gather ancestors covered nine to 15 kilometers a day, just, you know, gathering food. Hunters uh, ran, you know, 10 to 25 kilometers, two to three times a week. It's like doing a half marathon or a 10K several days a week. Um, and stationary farmers, and so from about 10,000 years ago to even as little as 100 years ago, most of the Canadian, most populations were stationary farmers and even at the turn of the century 1900 about 70 percent of the Canadian population was involved in agriculture and stationary farming and even now I think it's one in seven jobs in Canada involves involved farming but you know 100 years ago most farming jobs were quite physically active involving over eight hours a day of moderate to vigorous physical activity and we have examples of that with the Amish communities now in, in Ontario and down in Pennsylvania, where they average, you know, 15, 18,000 steps a day. Um, and then when they're, when they're in high season, when they're harvesting, it can be as high as 30, 40,000 steps a day when they're working the fields and things. They have low levels of obesity and, and low levels of chronic disease. There's also examples even in third world countries now, you know, for example, 50% of women in third world countries walk more than five kilometers a day for water, which is just an, another example of how in mo many environments we have adapted to high levels of physical activity. And now in a modernized environment, we don't do it as much as we probably need to in order to keep our bodies um, healthy. So, that's kind of the historical reference, but even in the last 50 years, they've actually done a better job at, at uh, identifying what the physical activity and nutrition uh, behaviors have been. And what they've shown is that in the last 50 years, physical activity levels have dropped quite dramatically and dietary levels dropped till about the mid eighties and then they kind of increased. Um, and they kind of went up like that in the 80s when uh, fast food and processed food kind of increased. And so over the last 50 years, physical activity levels have dropped by about 350 to 500 calories per day across all domains of physical activity, whether it's leisure time, occupational work, uh, active transportation, across all those domains, we've reduced our activity levels by 350 to 500 calories. And since, uh, again, the early 80s, our sugar intake has increased by almost 300 calories a day. Uh, it's now in everything that we eat. Again, at the turn of the century, the average intake of sugar for, the, for North American was about two kilograms per year. And now our average intake in North America is 75 kilograms a year per person in North America. So that's how things have changed. And, and so you can understand why as a population, we're gaining weight. Um, that the average North American gains one to two pounds every year that they live in our society. So that's from you know age five to age 55. The average person, uh, when they reach retirement age, is about 50 pounds overweight, 25 to 50 pounds overweight. And that's just being in our society because of these changing dynamics. And so you have to go against the grain and do the opposite of what society is kind of leading you towards in order to be healthy. It's actually abnormal behavior to be healthy in today's society. So you have to consciously think to go out of your way to eat 
good foods and to get regular physical activity. And this is affecting our population. So, you know, if we compare our baby boomer generation, which is the ones that are reaching retirement age and uh, right now compared to the, um, you know, the pre-depression uh, generation and pre-World War II generation that, you know, the amount of regular exercise is dropping, the amount of regular physical activity is, is dropped quite precipitously by two and a half fold. You know, the number of people in excellent health has dropped by 200% essentially as a relative number, but an absolute number of 20%. And we can see that obesity has increased, hypertension has increased, and things like hypercholesterol has more than doubled. You know, so these are things that our current generation is experiencing. And even our young generation, uh, there's been fitness testing on, um, on kids. There's been a national survey that they used to do in the 80s that they've now picked up again. And the data there shows that uh, our, our kids now are taller, they're heavier, they're rounder, weaker, less flexible and less aerobically fit than we were in 1981. And, and now for the first time in our history, our children's lifespan could be two to five years less than our own. So lifespan has basically been increasing largely through public health measures in the early 1900s, but then through you know, medical interventions and even um, medications and things like that and improving healthcare. Uh, but now we're kind of rounding the curve and going the other way because of poor fitness and, and these kinds of things that's gonna be affecting us as we get older. The, the interesting thing though, is it's not just uh, the effect of obesity, it's the effect of inactivity on our health. And so this graph here shows that there's two curves here. The top curve in pointing to in green is that, you know, if you're of normal weight or overweight or obese, the curves there, which is the survival rate curves, um, are the same for those of good cardiorespiratory fitness. And then the ones who have poor cardiorespiratory fitness, whether you're overweight, obese, or normal weight, that's where the difference of in this graph is almost 50% different in the um, survival rate that those of good cardiorespiratory fitness are much better off whether or not you're overweight or not. You know, you could be of normal weight, you could be overweight, but as long as you have good cardiorespiratory fitness, your health is going to be that much better. And so in that regard, this is why um, it's not just the obesity epidemic, it's the wolf in sheep's clothing the wolf is the poor cardiorespiratory fitness that's been created through physical inactivity. The, the weight is, can compound issues, but it's really the poor cardiorespiratory fitness that is driving a lot of this, this behavior. And, and that's because physical activity is a powerful driver of all of our physiological systems. So muscle is designed to move and move a lot and use up lots of energy. So all of our other systems, whether it's our cardiovascular system, our endocrine system, our digestive system, our nervous system, is all there to support muscle with energy and the ability to move and, and you know, seek out food to feed our big brain. But this is kind of how we've adapted is that, we, you know, and, and this is even an old picture because they're over a a PC computer that's uh, quite out of date now, but it's the inactivity that's more concerning than the obesity. Again, that's the inactivity is the wolf in the sheep's clothing that we've kind of in the popular media is focused on the obesity epidemic, but it's really the fact that we're not moving and our health is declining because our fitness is declining. So to again, peel back the layers of the onion here, it's important to understand the physical activity continuum. And in this regard, sedentary behavior is any waking behavior characterized by an energy expenditure less than 1.5 mets. And a met is a metabolic equivalent, means the multiples of resting metabolism. So if you're sedentary, you're at one met. So if you're seated in your chair at home right now, you're at one metabolic equivalent. 
Um, if I do light physical activity, such as standing like I'm doing now, especially if I talk with my hands a lot, I'm up around 1.7 mets or up to two mets um, because I'm standing. And so therefore you're no longer sedentary. And what we've learned is that that sedentary physiology that takes over basically shuts down all of our physiological systems. And so we want to avoid that sedentary as much as possible by accumulating as much light physical activity as we can. And, and then even better, when we get into the moderate and vigorous physical activities, because those things strengthen our body and challenge our physiology to improve our fitness, which makes us more resilient, more resilient against disease, more resilient against infections, and these kinds of things. So moderate physical activity at three METs is really just a, you know, a walk that, you know, a fairly, a brisk walk is about four METs, but a, you know, a reasonably good pace walk is three METs. And if you, you know, really gave her on that, you'd be up to six METs, which is kind of breaking into a bit of a jog. And that's where we get into vigorous physical activity. But any um, minute that you can accumulate there adds to your health. And so without getting too deep into the weeds here, I just thought I would show you some of the data that, that kind of outlines this, uh, this picture. And so this graph here is accumulation. It was a, a meta-analysis of 41 studies over 830,000 participants across all these different studies that looks at mortality risk across um, sedentary time. So on the far right of this graph, that's where people spend more than three quarters of their day sedentary. Whereas on the left part of this graph, you spend less than 25% of your day sedentary. And again, across that span, there's about a 50% difference in mortality. So if you can you know, spend the majority of your day moving, you're going to be a, a lot better off. And that's where we get that that from the guidelines now, there's that statement, try and accumulate at least three hours a day of light physical activity, and the more you do, the better. And, and you know, this is where we get, you know, quite dramatic differences in mortality and type 2 diabetes when we look at, you know, people who are sedentary most of the time versus not. Now, if you're active and you do that MVPA, you can actually eliminate a lot of that risk from sedentary behavior. And so um, the hazard ratio at low physical activity, so the far right of that graph, you can reduce that risk if you are sedentary most of the day. If you go for that 30-minute walk at lunch and get your MVPA, you can reduce that risk by about 46%. But even if you're active most of the day, doing exercise still provides significant improvement and benefit because you're improving your fitness. So even if you're active most of the time, still getting out and doing that exercise still improves your health. And that's a very significant effect, 16% across 800,000 people. It's a highly significant effect. And so you can also take you know, from this that uh, you can still see, though, that being active most of the day has, you know, similar benefits or even sometimes greater benefits than if you're sedentary most of the time and you, all you do is exercise. And that's what we see sometimes with our university population is that they're studying and sitting in classes all day and then doing sedentary recreational behaviors on phones and video games and, and various things but then they'll get their hour a day of exercise, but then they're sedentary the rest of the day. And actually moving more throughout the day might actually even be uh, better for your health than, than doing that. Now, uh, I think this is my, my last data slide, I think, um, that kind of shows this relationship in detail. And this is one of the first studies in 2018 that showed accelerometer data. So this is actual measured physical activity. A lot of our understanding of physical activity and relationships and health were based on people's report of their physical activity. And we know that people tend to over-report their physical activity, but this is actually measured physical activity. So where we get that 30% improvement in um, or reduction in risk of premature death mortality, that's what a hazard ratio is, 
is where that arrow is on this diagram, which is our guidelines. About 30 minutes a day gives you about a 30% reduction in your risk of dying prematurely from all causes. But you can see based on that red line that any part across that line, any minute you do of MVPA is actually better than the point before it. So if you're you know, at the reference point there, which is the top left at 1.1, where you're not really moving, or this, this group would not be moving it very much. If you move for five minutes, it's better than zero. If you move for 20 minutes, it's better than five. If you move for 40 minutes, it's better than 20. And that improvement keeps on going down all the way to almost 80 minutes a day, 100 minutes a day is where it kind of plateaus at about an 80% reduction in relative risk of premature death. So it's basically, it equates to about a minute a day relative risk reduction. So the more you do, the better your health is going to be um, related to overall health. And so the take home message there is that any minute that you can do a physical activity is good and more is better. And it plateaus at about 100 minutes a day. After that, it's kind of reached your genetic limits and uh, and you'd be doing things more for, you know, sport or exercise, you know, uh, performance means or something like that. So you're not going to get any more health benefits. Um, now, the other thing is, is that people thought, well, you know, do I exercise? Do I have to do it all at one time? You know, those are questions. And they also analyze this. And now because they can measure with accelerometers, they show that whether you accumulate that the, that physical activity in a minute at a time, five minutes, 10 minutes at a time, it really doesn't matter that much. Uh, we now have the resolution to show that any minute you can do at any given time is going to benefit your health. So if all you got is three minutes to go walk a flight of stairs, go for it because that's going to help. If all you have is one minute to when you're seated at work and and you don't have a time for a break, you know, standing up and doing a couple chair squats, that's going to contribute to your health. Now, it's going to be even better if you can get out and go for a walk in 10 minutes or do some exercise. But the, the key message there is that uh, exercise and physical activity is much more accessible than we used to think it was in the sense that, you know, we can do things at any time. And that's a good, good news for us now in the COVID epidemic where the, we don't have the opportunity to get to the refit center. You can take your, your refit pack there at home and with your resistance bands and follow along with a virtual class and fit that activity and exercise in when you can. Because any way to stay out of that lowest physical activity quartile is going to dramatically improve your health. So the more you can keep moving, the better. And these effects are consistent across uh, various chronic diseases. So, you know, the, the guidelines and exercise and diabetes, they show that the beneficial effects on, for example, glucose management measured by somebody's A1C level, that's similar to a first line kind of medication. They're beneficial uh, regardless of whether or not you, you lose weight, whether you do aerobic exercise or resistance exercise, you can get uh, important effects, clinical effects on improving glucose uh, control by doing that exercise. And so, you know, those exercise guidelines and diabetes are there uh, because they're effective. Same thing with coronary heart disease. And I see next week you have Paul O that's coming to talk about uh, some of the 10 steps for your health. He's one of the top cardiologists and cardiac rehabilitation uh, people in, in Canada, if not the world. And, you know, he'll show you that uh, with moderate coronary artery disease, if you're achieving the guidelines, which is 150 minutes a week, which equates to about 100 or 1500 kilocalories a week, you can stabilize coronary artery disease. If you do less than that, coronary artery disease can progress. If you do more than that, you can actually regress uh, fatty acid plaques and things like that that are, that are creating some of those problems with cardiovascular disease. So this has been shown in cardiac rehab and why cardiac rehab programs are, 
so prevalent across Canada and around the world is because of this very clear evidence that shows how effective exercise is as medicine in this regard. Next week, you also have Kristen Campbell, who's going to talk about cancer and exercise. So I'm not going to belabor this uh, slide too much, but it basically shows that exercise is effective in pre-treatment, during treatment, post-treatment, and even in palliative care across an, a range of, of uh, areas, not only uh, physical outcomes, but psychological outcomes and, uh, you know, reducing the severity of of cancer related fatigue and pain. And again, if we think of 10 years ago, our thinking about exercise and cancer was, you know, just go home, sit on the couch, you don't want to stress yourself too much. And then the evidence came out that the number one important thing that you can do to improve your outcomes if you're in cancer treatment or prevent cancer is actually to exercise. Because cancer or exercise is inherently anti inflammatory and has all these positive things that actually help to boost your immune system and improve its ability to, to deal, with, uh, deal with issues. Um, this is also, when it comes to mental health now, is a big issue that's talked about. Um, and our evidence now shows that even as little as 10 minutes a week, of physical activity can significantly improve your mood and happiness. So again, one of the things that we do now is we're, you know, tend to be on devices and things like that. And, and um, our mood can be affected, but just going for a 10 minute walk can actually uh, change how we think. And if we do 15 minutes per day of vigorous physical activity it can actually change the neurotransmitters in our brain, like serotonin and these things that uh, reduce the risk of depression, even in those at risk of depression, by almost a quarter. And so there, uh, there's very strong evidence for the effect of exercise at improving mental health outcomes. This is actually data from, um, uh, or self-report from actual patients. And they asked, this slide here is, the vertical axis is what patients report as being the most effective treatments to treat a certain condition. And then what they counted for was um, out of this one is 15,000 patients reporting is how popular it was, meaning how, uh, how many patients were regularly using this treatment to get the effects that they desired. And you can see that there's medications there, there's caffeine, journaling, massage therapy, sleep, very effective, but the one on the far right quadrant means it's most effective and highly popular to treat depression was exercise. Number one thing across all these different um, treatments that patients themselves report as being effective. Same thing for treatments of anxiety. You can look at all those different medications and, and different, uh, uh, you know, lifestyle wellness things like drinking water and prayer and psychotherapy and meditation. But there again, on the far right uh, side is, is exercise that is both effective and highly popular to uh, treat anxiety as reported by thousands and thousands of patients. One of the other areas that again affects our aging population is arthritis and uh, you know back musculoskeletal problems that's one of the most common sources of disability in our population and this is why we have guidelines in our um, physical activity guidelines for strength or resistance activity because uh, particularly for older adults that as osteoarthritis accumulates it's the one condition that has the largest effect size for treatment is actually resistance exercise and reducing pain actually and, and, and aerobic exercise as well. They're both similar, but reducing pain by 35 to 50% in those with osteoarthritis, mild to moderate osteoarthritis. Severe osteoarthritis, there's some maybe some uh, mechanical things going on, but for uh, mild to moderate osteoarthritis, the number one treatment is exercise. And that's partly because um, 
inflammation and pain accumulates if we don't use our muscles and use our joints. It's also number one risk factor in people over the age of uh, 65 is falls. And that if we do strength training and balance training, it reduces our risk of falls by 25 to 40%. Strength training also reduces our cardiovascular mortality because of the effects on blood pressure that actually resistance training, it increases your blood pressure during the activity, but then afterwards you get actually a resetting of your blood pressure that actually reduces your risk. It helps to preserve muscle mass, which is important in uh, diabetes management. And it improves uh, cognitive function, that when you're doing resistance exercise and, and challenging your brain and your ability to move, it actually uh, can maintain brain size, as does uh, aerobic physical activity. And the key thing that it extends the quality of life and independence, that exercise in general increases life expectancy to, by two to five years, but improves the time of independence by 10 to 14 years, meaning that the average Canadian now, the life expectancy is between 85 and 87 years, but the average Canadian becomes dependent upon others at about age 72 or 74. So that means the average Canadian spends the last 10 to 14 or 10, 12 years of their life in relative dependence on others. But if you're fit and strong, and, and aerobically fit, that that extends in well into your late 80s, that you can remain independent if you're, you're fit and well. And that's probably the biggest seller for our baby boom generation is that you're not dependent upon your kids and, and on others to, uh, to take care of yourself. So we as Canadians kind of know this, that um, you know, we did a study here in the Annapolis Valley, asked over 2,000 patients, what do you think is the most important way of improving your physical health? And across the board, people recognize physical activity is important. Um, changing diet, maybe less so, losing weight a little bit, quitting smoking. <laughs> people recognize it as a benefit to their health, but uh, it pales in comparison to the recognition of physical activity. I can see there this is my common joke, if you've ever seen me do this, that nobody in Nova Scotia wants to drink less alcohol to improve their physical health. That's, uh, that's my, my joke for the day. But um, the, the key thing that many people identify as limiting their ability to be active is their health condition. And so this is why this is coming back around to why exercise is medicine and why medical fitness facilities have a very, very important function. People at the refit center, you have qualified uh, clinical exercise physiologists, you have physiotherapists, you have doctors, sports medicine people on staff that know, how, and you have nurses, you have people that can deal with people's health conditions because that's their number one barrier for being active. It's not lack of skill or motivation or energy three to four times greater, it's concerns about their health condition for older adults to be active, to get all those benefits that we've talked about. And so in that regard, you know, the vision is for exercise as medicine that the doctor of the future will prescribe no drugs, but will interest his patients in the care and nutrition of the human frame and in the cause and prevention of disease. It was rather prophetic over a hundred years ago that we're still not there yet, <laughs> that we need to have a healthcare system that can deliver on this, this vision that we're, we're actually taking care of ourselves as opposed to treating our illnesses. And this is where, uh, you know, if you lift two of these, you won't have to call me in the morning. That's where we wanna to get to, um, is that our, our medical system is helping support us in being active and actually encouraging our health behaviors such as exercise and that we won't have to do as much uh, medications in that regard. We need to look at you know, how we address walk-in clinics. And this is actually from the Toronto Rehab that Paul O is gonna talk about probably, that they started walking clinics, you know, where the healthcare professionals walk with their patients while they're doing treatment, uh, doing counseling while you're moving because they, it, it embodies that active um, kind of motion. And that's, you know, again, the refit center has that beautiful walking track there that people can be active even in the wintertime. And so that's where 
uh, medical fitness facilities and the refit center, all walks of life, people with all health conditions. There's tons of programs there for everybody to be safe in pursuing their exercise goals and being happy and healthy as, as we age or as we're looking for performance or just taking care of ourselves to, to uh, be resilient in this situation of COVID. So um, this is where we came from with our exercise as medicine message. It kind of is now around the world in over 50 countries. Uh, we have a national advisory council and actually Sue Bereski, who is your CEO at ReFit is our clinical exercise professional representative on our national advisory council. And she embodies the spirit of exercise as medicine and delivers it through the, and uh, encourages it through the programming at the ReFit center there. And that we have that vision that physical activity is an integral part of the prevention and treatment of chronic disease in the Canadian healthcare system so that more Canadians can meet the movement guidelines. And we, we know that healthcare providers that support and encourage and even prescribe exercise uh, can help you to be more active, especially if you can access recognized exercise professionals in, in places that can support you to, uh, to do that exercise in places like the ReFit Center. I'm gonna skip over that one, but basically, um, wanted to thank you all for your time and attention and uh, and conclude that we the evidence there is very clear that physical activity and exercise is potent in preventing and managing chronic disease and that healthcare has an important role to address but we need these practical implementation strategies of having exercise programming in communities at facilities like like the refit, it really is the gold standard in North America at one medical fitness facility of the year, I think in 2015. And that we need to have collaborative practice in communities with qualified exercise professionals like you have at the refit center that can help people that have chronic conditions to feel safe about their exercise behaviors so that they can take care of themselves. So thank you very much. And I'll take Thanks, Jonathan. If uh, it's Rhea talking, the director of health and fitness. You can't see me necessarily, or maybe you can. If you have any questions, you can use the box. There I am. You can use the chat box and we'll um, see if Jonathan can read it as well, or we'll read them out. Just letting you know, Jonathan, we won medical fitness facility of the year this year as well. Oh, you did as well. Yes. Wow. So it's, a, it's a new award. We just got it a few weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. So. So if anybody has well, questions, I don't know how to, thank you. Yeah, it was a great testament award. to the job that you guys are doing. That's awesome. Yeah. If anybody has any questions, you can type them in. So we have one. So you say that exercise is helpful. Is it helpful to exercise when you are just coming up, coming off a flare up? Um, a, a yeah, that's a very individual uh, kind of thing and it depends on the type of flare-up the um if it's rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis or if it's um a different inflammatory condition it is a really individual thing based on you know your medication profile and various things most of the evidence now though shows us that as much physical activity as you can manage that you, and you are the best judge of what that is, is better. That again, you know, 40 years ago, somebody had a heart attack and the prescription was a month of bed rest. And we figured out that that ages the cardiovascular system about 20 years, uh, a month of bed rest. Uh, 20 years ago, we used to think that when you got back pain, the best prescription was a month of bed rest. And then we figured out that that made the condition worse. Uh, 10 years ago, you know, somebody's going through cancer treatment, the, the prescription was, you know, three weeks or four weeks of bed rest. And we figured out that that made it worse. And so osteoarthritis, you know, we can go through the list that all of our preconceived notions about what we thought um, that, that to rest the body uh, would be helpful in recovery. We know that actually moving the body provides it energy. It, it gives it it gives it resources, it, it increases blood flow, it, it circulates anti-inflammatory factors that as long as you're not pushing it too far, 
um, at a higher intensity than what your body can handle, that it will help you to get back into balance because your body needs that physical activity to stay in balance. So if you're coming off a flare up, then do a little bit less than what you think you can do until you can get into the rhythm of doing what you know you can do. So just kind of dial it back a little bit and then kind of work your way back in. And that's, again, I use the example of back pain. Now the treatment for back pain is get moving as soon as you possibly can. You know, if you have a back flare up, take care of the pain, but start moving again as soon as you can. Because the sooner you get your body moving again, the faster it'll bounce back. And so I would use that as an example, but it's, it is a very individual kind of thing that you have to, you know, work out with your, your exercise trainer, as well as your, you know, your physician or healthcare provider. Okay. There's a couple more questions here. I missed one. So I don't know if Gord, you can read one, but one from Kaylee Evans, who I believe you worked with when uh, you I were know Kaylee teacher. very well. Yeah. <laughs> she says, Thanks for the great talk. I'm wondering what advice, you would tell people who know all of the benefits of physical activity and yet are still not motivated enough to get active? Well, interestingly enough, uh, the way that I kind of answer this one is that a lot of times people wait for motivation, but if you begin, motivation will follow you. And that's because our, our psychology a lot of times um, limits uh, where we're at. And that's that the law of inertia, a body in, in at rest stays at rest and a body in motion stays in motion. And that once you can overcome the inertia of not moving just for a little bit, you can change your physiology because it changes your psychology. As soon as you get moving around, you get oxygen up to the brain, you change the neurotransmitters. Well, that changes your mood. And the evidence shows, you know, even 10 minutes of physical activity can improve your mood uh, and happiness in a week. But that means that even today, right now, if you give yourself five minutes and say, you know what, I really don't feel like doing this. I'm not into it. So I'm gonna give myself five minutes. And after five minutes, I still don't feel like it. I'd give myself permission to stop. But inevitably, or most times, nine times out of 10, is that after that five minutes, you get the blood flow going, you get the neurotransmitters going, your mood will be different, your psychological out outlook will be different, and you'll probably feel like going a little bit more than what you thought you could do 10 minutes ago. And so that's kind of how I, I look at that. A lot of people wait for motivation to follow them, but a lot of times you might need to begin in order for that motivation to follow you. Great. And I know that um, it's tough, especially if you're in pain or something like that, sometimes it's really tough to start, but sometimes taking that first step courageously is what can help take the next step and the next step and the next step. And sometimes you need support to do that, like from an, a fitness professional to help you take that first step. Um, there was one comment and I, I've lost it on here, so I apologize to whoever typed it, but she was generally, she was relating to the fact that do you present to kind of the general public? I have, and in, in Nova yeah. Scotia, I'm actually the chair of Exercises Medicine Nova Scotia, and we did, we did an Exercises Medicine Nova Scotia initiative, and we, I've given several talks, you know, through the diabetes, uh, at the, the library, and we were planning to do another set of talks and then it kind of got derailed somehow. I'm not quite sure. It just didn't get off the ground because I think um, Nova Scotia Health Authority ran into some different priorities that they were restructuring and things and it didn't kind of get on the, the, the map and then COVID happened and, and things like that. So uh, we're hoping that there'll be some other kind of public talks in, in Nova Scotia. But now with Zoom, you can kind of do it anywhere at any time. Yeah. It's a great thing. We're super, we're super excited to have you. One last comment, and I think then we'll wrap it up. We'll be sure. conscious of everybody's time. So we have a we had a great member with a success story telling us that she's diagnosed in with diabetes in 2019. She agrees exercise is medicine. She's currently down 72 pounds and diabetic free. So we're really happy for that. Amazing. Um, the one just came in quickly. It says one one of the slide indicates 150 minutes per week of aerobic activity. But I, re I missed the recommendation on how much time per, per week should be spent on resistance activity. So resistance exercise doesn't have a time recommended recommendation. It has a sessions. 
So you're recommended to do two or more sessions per week or, or um, you know, times of resistance training. And that's because um, the amount of time that it's done isn't as important as actually doing the strength work itself. And so as long as you're doing maybe the recommendations are five to eight exercises, you know, of different major muscle groups, you know, two to three sets of eight to 10 repetitions, and you do that at least twice a week, you're, you're definitely meeting guidelines and getting most of the benefits there. Okay. So I think everybody's maybe had a chance to have a question or two. So really, again, once again, thanks, Jonathan, for uh, doing this for us. Um, I think all the people My that pleasure. tuned in were really quite happy with the information. And I'm going to challenge all of the refit members that are watching that you better do an online class tomorrow and uh, get your 150 minutes in and get your resistance training in and make sure you're not sedentary during the day so everybody should stand up as soon as you end this call and move around so yeah. again we're super happy that you could do this for there us you go. have a great day there you go okay. yeah there okay. you go everybody's up and moving yeah. okay so thank you Jonathan. A little late see you later me. 10 o'clock so thanks everybody we'll see you yeah you, you can go to bed we've got a few more hours yeah <laughs> Thanks very much. Okay. See you, everybody.